<laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome to uh, the first panel uh, of the Wise Up conference today. I hope by the end of this panel we'll all be a lot wiser on the subject matter we're discussing. I just want to briefly, you've met, uh, you've been introduced to some of the people on the panel uh, already. Uh, Imam Talib Sharif, president of the uh, Masjid Muhammad, Said Khan, uh, to my left, a fellow, he's is a fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Uh, Steve Miska, to my right, is the director of the First Amendment Voice Alliance, who served for 25 years in the U.S. military. Arsalan Suleiman, who you've uh, been introduced to already, um, who is a special envoy, former acting special envoy to the Organization for the Islamic Conference. Uh, Bob Sil Silverman, all the way to my right, is director, no, is, yes, is director of Muslim-Jewish relations for the AJC and also has a career spanning more than a quarter of a century at the State Department. Uh, Rabia Ahmed, to my left, director of media and public affairs at, at the Mu Muslim Public Affairs Council. And Eric Treen, to my left, is a special counsel for religious discrimination at the U.S. Department of Justice. It may sound like I'm rushing through this, but I was told a few minutes ago that this one-hour panel has to be done in 20, yeah, 30 minutes, actually. So I'm trying to, at least my voice doesn't go high when I speak fast. Um, so we're going to start by watching a uh, brief video. Lisa, go ahead. We should take anybody who's a known Muslim and put them in a separate line. Islam is a violent religion. It's not a religion of peace. And they mean to kill as many of us as they can. And it's because it's what God wants them to do. I think it would be impossible for a Muslim to be a good citizen in America because he must swear his allegiance to Allah. And that if all Muslims would boycott airlines, we could dispense with airport security altogether. It's clear that the problem is Islam. The Muslim threat to the world is not isolated. It's huge. The Muslims will see the West through razor wire. I don't want to hear any more about Islam. I don't want to hear one more word about Islam. Take your religion and shut up. I don't believe we could all see that as well as all of you, but I think we got the message. Muslims being cast as part of the problem as outsiders. Uh, Imam Talib, can you um, talk to us about Muslims being seen as, as recent arrivals here in this country. That's, that's not true, right? Yeah, it couldn't be nowhere further away from the truth. Obviously, we look back in history, uh, we know it's very well documented now. Even before America was a, was a nation, you know, Muslims have traveled to this country. Uh, in fact, in, uh, right here in this city, right here in 1752, uh, a Muslim scholar, uh, Yarrow Mahmoud, you know, and again, America, this is 1752. Uh, so that tells us that America, again, being established as a nation in 1776, that Muslims uh, uh, were here. And of course, a lot of slaves uh, were Muslims. The number has been going up in terms of the number of slaves that were Muslims. The highest number I've seen now is 60% of the slaves were Muslims. And uh, I just want to just quote one of our presidents, the one that had a heavy hand in that uh, Declaration of Independence. One of the things he said was, uh, this is something he would say, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom was designed to protect all faith, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian, and the Mohammedan, you know, and back then that's what the Muslims, Muslims were called. And uh, so they were recognized back then. In fact, America's uh, first of treaties and alliances, they depended and relied on a Muslim nation to protect their most valued, valued uh, resources on the ships and the waterways and the persons that were on them. Uh, you know, so we have, it's a strong history there in terms of, uh, and we have a museum here in the city that shows that Muslims have been participating really in every single war. Uh, that America has been in. So, it's been here. so this is no, no, it's farther away from the truth to say that this is something new and uh, like one of the young ones said earlier, you go back home. This is home. This is home. And Saeed, uh, if that's the case, why are Muslims uh, facing the, the hostility and the challenges that, that, that they are now? Well, I mean, I think Muslims are the latest in a, uh, a sad stream of, uh, of various demographic groups that have faced uh, an awful lot of demonization in, in the United States. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, we found this to be the case with particularly South and East European arrivals, Jews, Italians, uh, Irish. I think it's important that 
uh, to remember that none of these three groups were even considered to be white a hundred years ago. So this lactification process is something that happened as uh, the Howard University esteemed scholar Suleiman Yang calls it. Uh, but we are living in a particular moment today where the demographics of the entire country are going to shift within a generation. As the United States uh, is moving toward becoming a majority minority country within 25 to 26 years, it's going to be less white uh, and more brown, less Anglo-Saxon and more Latin American, more, uh, less Protestant and more Catholic. And for people who uh, cling to what used to be called, you know, your grandfather's Oldsmobile, your grandfather's America, it's not going to look like that anymore. And as a result of economic, social, cultural, political feelings of instability and uncertainty, uh, there needs to be some group uh, that is blamed. And right now it seems as though Muslim Americans relative to other groups lack the social and the political capital to really be able to push back. It's becoming profitable. Uh, to hate Muslims, both politically and economically these days. So this anti-Sharia movement that we, we hear about, uh, that somehow our constitution is, is, is you know, threatened by a, a foreign code of law, that's something that, did we hear that before when, when there were other outsiders in other, other forms? There were, there were efforts being made uh, close to 100 years ago with what were called the Blaine Amendments to push back on what was seen as the Catholicization of America. And I remember coming to the United States from England. Uh, I mean, everyone who comes from England tends to be snooty anyway, but uh, recognizing even as an eight-year-old that how unoriginal were menus on Fridays in public school. All they served was fish sandwiches and macaroni and cheese wherever I went. And then you realize, well, that was an accommodation uh, to Catholic students uh, for, being, for having meatless Friday. So we've been through this before, but as, as always, we, we like to think that we've moved beyond some of our darker angels. And we find that in many ways today, Muslim Americans serve as canaries in a coal mine. That the anti-Sharia legislation that is being promulgated in as many as 38 out of 50 states comes with uh, anti-progressive uh, legislation in other ways. Uh, in North Carolina, for example, in 2013, had an anti-Sharia bill, but at the last minute they tacked on one of the nation's most restrictive uh, riders when it came to women's uh, reproductive uh, health care access. So we see how these are usually wor uh, uh, work together, that we're going to go ahead and lead with the anti-Sharia because people aren't going to object to that, and then we're going to slide in what may be a more nefarious agenda as well. Fascinating. Um, Steve, you bring a, a unique perspective to all this as a military veteran. Um, what's your take on, on the Islamophobia? Sure. Well, um, what I would say is, uh, so I'm Steve Miska. I had spent 25 years in the U.S. Army and uh, three combat tours to Iraq and three combat tours to D.C., uh, DC, <laughs> I think were, were the more complex <laughs> tours by far. Um, but I, I would say the notion that Ibrahim, who spoke in the press conference as a veteran, that his service is somehow less than my service as a veteran, I just totally find atrocious because all of us, when we come into the service, swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States. To include my brothers in the Foreign Service, they swear an oath to the Constitution in the United States and those ideals, not to a political party, not to a president or an individual, to those aspirational ideals. And we know as human beings, whether we wore a uniform or not, that we're all, uh, we have our shortcomings and we're never going to probably get to those aspirational ideals, but that's what we're, we're striving for. And um, this, this lack of tolerance or the villainization of others is what Islamophobia is all about. And that subculture that has really uh, germinated here in the United States is very dangerous. And so this report is critical to Educate. We're, we might not be able to change the leaders of the subculture of Islamophobia. We might not be able to change their minds, but there's a lot of people out there on a fence in the middle who just don't know. 
and educating them so that they can make informed decisions and letting them interact on a daily basis with people who are different than them is what I think it will take in order to overcome that. Thanks. And I just realized that I introduced everybody on the panel, but not myself. So <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jerome Sokolovsky. I'm the editor-in-chief of Religion News Service, which is an 85-year-old news organization. That's It's the only news organization devoted to covering religion, uh, all religion, atheism, non-religion uh, as well. And we cover it without, uh, non-denominationally, without, from, you know, from without any perspective. <laughs> I wish people would clap like that for us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're at, we're at religionnews.com if you want to come and see, see our work. Um, so let's move on. Uh, our salon, uh, last night I, I sat down to read the Wise Up book and then I realized it was 300 pages. <laughs> 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 so I am just eternally grateful to you for the, for the executive summary, the three <laughs> that three-page <laughs> summary. <laughs> um, but you wrote an another part of the book which is uh, about s uh, surging hate crimes and that it's uh, called a concern for all Americans. So tell us how hate crimes are surging um, and why, it's why is it a concern for everyone? I, I can't take credit for that policy because there were other authors on this list. Um, yes, the chapter on hate crimes is an important part of uh, one of the current experiences that the Muslim community is facing, but also many other communities in the United States. Um, unfortunately, about uh, 2008, um, there's been a fall in the number of hate crimes. As we speak, um, but I say it's a concern for all Americans because um, the notion of America, the notion of a country that can choose to be auto in part is a notion that is uh, is something that I think all Americans try to uh, buy into. What hate crimes are meant to do is they're meant to sow division and they're meant to um, put fear in a community that would otherwise hold and expect unity. That, unfortunately, is what we have to do as part of Americans. And there are hate crimes that are also targeting African Americans, Americans, uh, but for the purposes of this book, we focus on The FBI puts out hate crimes data compiled with voluntary uh, contributions from law enforcement agencies across the United States. And um, that data is not complete because there's some uh, organizations that are trying to get that data But even with that data as a baseline, in 2015, uh, there was a 67 percent by Muslim groups. Um, 2016, we haven't seen that data put out yet, but we oh, there are indications that we expect a rise in the number of hate crimes. Southern Poverty Law Center has been doing a lot of work to document uh, run up of the presidential election campaign in 2016 after uh, the election itself, um, and other organizations have been doing work to put that indication in the data. Southern Poverty Law Center is actually the So it's 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 worse now than it was after 9/11. I think arguably, and we'll see what the census data looks like. Um, the two organizations that did the they looked at that data to see that the number of violent hate crimes almost matched the number of hate crimes that were committed by Muslim groups. And I don't know if this is. Your, uh, your field too, but I understand it also affects others, like Sikhs, people who are often um, confused with, with mu Muslims out of ignorance, really. That's absolutely right, and that's, um, all of these crimes are tied to where people are from. So as a Muslim, I think it's kind of ignorance that is part of some of that. I don't even know enough to know the person that they're targeting. There are a number of
So, uh, Bob, you've established a, a Muslim Jewish Advisory Council uh, at the AJC. What are you doing with it, and, and why is it important now? really pleased uh, to be here and talk about uh, support from the American Jewish uh, Committee, the AJC, for this. As Saeed said, uh, nativist reactions are common in our country. They go all the way back to the founding of our country. And today, it's the Muslim community. And today, it's the obligation of all of us to stand up to support our fellow citizens who are Muslim. And um, as Arsalan said, the hate crime sta uh, statistics are clear. There's been a huge increase in attacks on Muslims, vandalism of mosques. So AJC, and uh, I'm proud to be the first ever director of Muslim Jewish Relations there, have set up a national Muslim Jewish Advisory Council whose uh, primary focus is combating hate crimes together, these two communities are doing that. And we also have six regional affiliates uh, York, Washington, Miami, Dallas, which met yesterday, um, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and more to come. What are we doing? Uh, one very important thing we have to do, uh, do meaningful things to combat this hate crime uh, wave. I, I, we are um, adopting legislation. We're lobbying for a, a bill in Congress. I encourage everyone to uh, look into it. H.R. 1730 is a bill that amends the federal hate crime st uh, statute to further protect uh, religious institutions, not just mosques and churches and synagogues, but also uh, day schools, uh, community centers that have a religious affiliation because they're being under, they're being attacked. This bill, H.R. 1730, is called Protecting Religiously Affiliated Communities Act 2017 bipartisan. It has been drafted by a Republican side. It was introduced by Congressman Bischoff of Tennessee, a Republican, and has Democrats on it as well. Senator Dianne Feinstein from Illinois, Matt, uh, co-sponsored this bill. So we're lobbying for legislation. Let me just add one final thing. We can do more. There'll be more. You mentioned 9-11. And, and the statistics, and Ar Arsalan did too, and the comparison is there, on particularly on violent hate crimes. Here's a big difference between 9-11 and now. And in 9-11, right afterwards, you had a president, George W. Bush, who said, Islam is not our enemy. He visited a mosque, spoke out against uh, attacks on Muslims. That made a difference, because if you look at the hate crime statistics published by the FBI, the next year, Violent crimes against Muslims went way down. And right now, we don't have that presidential leadership. That's not a partisan statement. That's just a, note, uh, a comment. <laughs> and so I think it's incumbent on all of us, not just Muslims, but other citizens, uh, particularly uh, others, like Saeed said, like Jews, who have faced this in the past, to speak out now, to provide, to be there, to provide some of this leadership. And uh, I think. The leadership, the statements in the public matter, and that's what the hate crime statistics show. So, th so on, th on that note, Rabia, this idea of speaking out, uh, getting the community involved, uh, th that there's a survey in, in the Wise Up book in which I believe 80% of Muslims believe there should be a community engagement in preventing terrorism. So um, tell us a little bit about you know what? What are what? Are, what is the belief out there? How how? What should be done? So the I, the notion that there should be community partnerships um, as a way forward to deal with the issue or the threat of violent extremism um, doesn't just rest with pr public perception. It's actually what research tells us and experience shows us. Um, the organization that I work for, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, has been engaged on the on the issue of extremism for nearly two decades. And through all of our research and engagement on this issue, what we've always come back to is that the best way forward to address this problem is a partnered community solution with law enforcement. So what, is the, what does that look like? What does that actually mean? Um, 
that means that when a community um, is left best to do what it's supposed to do, and that's to build resilient, strong, well-rounded communities that address all of the needs that um, a community has, then they are best positioned um, to deal with the threat of extremism coming into their communities. And, and it's really important to say that the Muslim community is not alone in, in this issue. Every community has some issues that they deal with. And um, the important thing is, is to take a leadership role in it, um, not to deny it, to acknowledge it, to address it um, in a way that is, is, an, is meaningful and substantial. Um, and while the community is working on that front, it's very important for the government then to do what it's supposed to do. And that includes uh, protecting the civil rights of its community, because without that, you don't have the trust and you don't have the partnership that you need in order for this solution to work. Um, and, and there's a lot that law enforcement can do. I mean, it can engage our community um, in ways beyond national security, because you know, obviously, a community doesn't just want to be talked to when it has to do um, around public safety. Um, and and it's 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 a common sense approach but it's really um, what experience and history has shown us in terms of what drives down violence, what drives down the threat of social ills. Um, and it's really in our best interest to move along that way. Thanks. And, and Eric, you've been working, as I understand it, with Muslim communities. Um, what can the government do, or what is the government doing to guarantee that Muslims have the same uh, right to exercise their faith as, as all Americans do? Hi, is this on? Great. Yeah, uh, so several different areas have been mentioned this morning. The hate crimes, uh, earlier uh, someone mentioned the bullying, uh, and then there's also the construction of, of places of worship, all areas where Muslims have seen uh, substantial amounts of, of, of discrimination or, or, or hate crimes. And uh, the Civil Rights Division of Justice, um, since 9-11, has been very active in these areas. It's interesting, before 9-11, um, Muslims really barely registered on the hate crime statistics. Uh, there are some, some tragic cases. I even know someone personally who's a Sikh who was shot in New York in a, in a 1990s hate crime incident. But it was really not Muslim, Arab, Sikh, South Asian communities. Uh, it was not part of the story in the area of uh, construction of places of worship when they uh, passed a law in 2000, uh, the Religious Land Use Act, the emphasis was on synagogues having problems and churches having small evangelical churches and African American churches having uh, uh, problems. There are only two mosque cases in the, 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 the legislative record of over a thousand cases. And, but that all changed with 9-11. We saw a surge in hate crimes. Uh, the Department of Justice has been very active since then. We've uh, had 69 convictions in hate crimes uh, targeting these communities. It continues to be a problem, as Arsalan was saying, in the, in the FBI's hate crime statistics. We'll see in November, third week of November, what the numbers were for last year. But we know it's a problem. The Attorney General in June, uh, we had a, a, a hate crime summit that a lot of uh, Muslim community leaders were involved in, and, and LGBT and, and African American community leaders were involved in to look at the problem of hate crimes. And, and the Attorney General singled out you know, Muslim hate crimes are, are an area uh, where we've seen particular concern. And uh, we continue to, to prosecute these. We indicted an arson in, in June. Uh, we've had, con uh, in June, we uh, uh, sentenced a man uh, from Tennessee who uh, solicited others to plan an attack on a uh, Muslim, a small Muslim community in upstate New York, uh, Islamburg. Uh, so this continues to be a problem, but we have uh, made hate crimes a priority and continue to make it a priority uh, to try to, uh, you know, bring, you know, bring these people to justice and backstop the local governments when they uh, don't have the resources or the legal uh, tools to, to bring these cases. And the same thing in, in land use cases where, uh, and, and this is actually a story, it's a positive and negative story at the same time. I mean, the Muslim community is having a lot of trouble with construction of mosques, but the flip side of it is the community is 
growing. It's, it has uh, financially the resources to build. Uh, you have uh, Muslims moving to new communities uh, uh, in certain metropolitan areas where they have not been before and are the ones who are, are building mosques. Yes, they are sometimes running into resistance, uh, but they have a right to build. Uh, the religious land use law passed in 2000 gives them that right. And uh, Department of Justice has uh, just this year resolved four cases involving mosques that were illegally blocked from uh, building uh, when they had a right to do it on their own property. So how do you know when it's, when opposition to the construction of a new mosque is based on Islamophobia and when it might be based on legitimate concerns like too much traffic being brought to the neighborhood or, or you know, um, you know to sh casting shadow on other buildings? Yeah, I mean, st a majority of the cases that we handle uh, under this law are still Christian cases because the fact of the matter is most communities, especially with economic downturns, want buildings that will generate revenues and jobs. And yes, a mosque or a church creates a job, but not as many, right? So that's why Congress passed this law. And the law has a provision that bars intentional discrimination. So if you say, I don't like Muslims in the city council, you have proof that that's why they denied it. That's an easy case. But the law also has other tools in it. Um, I don't want to get into all the, the legal niceties of it, but if there is a uh, project and denying it will impose a substantial burden, well, then the burden shifts to the government to show why they have a good reason, why the traffic is so bad. It may be that, yeah, it'll increase traffic or revenues may go down a little bit, but can the government show that it is a substantial problem? And so this eliminates the need to get inside the minds of the city council members and say, were they anti-Muslim or were they just concerned about development and say, do they have a strong reason? So it's a tool that helps people of, of all religious faiths. I think there's some people I don't want to get inside the minds of <laughs> <laughs> in discussing this. So we have just a few minutes left, I believe, five or five minutes, 10, 10 minutes. Um, and I want to open it up to questions from the floor if anyone uh, wants to ask a question of our panelists here, uh, going once. Okay, and I, I believe there are microphones. Uh, you could just step over to the microphone so we could hear you. And then, yeah. And please uh, in introduce yourself as well. Um, Imam Faisal Khan from the Washington DC area. Um, Brother Said mentioned it is profitable to hate Muslims politically and economically. Could you probably define that what you say? I'd like to learn more about this. Sure. Um, thank you for your question. The question uh, dealing with the economics behind hate. Uh, there was a very good report uh, that came out a few years ago from the Center of American Progress on Fear Inc., which shows the money behind uh, the Islamophobia industry. But I would submit to you that, especially, unfortunately, with the midterm elections coming up, the idea of the invocation of Muslims as being a threat is going to be then deployed by candidates. And we've seen this in several election cycles where the danger of Muslims uh, is then being used. There was a case in Michigan where a, uh, 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 a candidate was in fact running openly by sending out fundraising literature uh, with a rather sad case that she was exploiting about female genital mutil uh, uh, mutilation. Uh, but she was using that to piggyback then an effort to pass anti-Sharia legislation, which had already been asked and answered uh, uh, and defeated, thankfully, two years prior to that. So from the political uh, perspective, you see how this is then becoming a self-generating phenomenon. Within the, uh, within the economics outside politics, well, all you have to do is take a look at talk radio and see how ratings then are being driven by the more toxic the discourse. And again, it's not just directed toward Muslims, but certainly many groups, but it certainly also gets an awful lot of likes and uh, Twitter followings, uh, the more outrageous the statements are made uh, regarding um, Islam. And even in the case of Las Vegas, the, uh, the desperation by some news outlets to try to link what uh, the Las Vegas uh, killer had done 
to a quote-unquote Muslim angle, saying that, well, he had traveled to uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi recently, so there must be some Muslim angle behind that. So it, it, it's something that certainly feeds upon itself. It's, uh, that's it interesting that you bring up, I'll get to your question in just a second, that you bring up the Las Vegas shooting, because there was also a discussion about you know, why aren't we calling this terrorism? Why, why are we always so quick to say this is... Uh, um, mental you know, illness. A crazy mental illness, a crazy yeah. person. Yeah. Can you address sure. that? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I, I suppose I, I should be thankful that people consider Muslims to be hyper sane, uh, <laughs> that, that there's really no possible uh, me mental illness, and, and yet there's a danger because, like any other community, Muslims, <coughs> are, I know this is going to be heretical, but they're not exactly exceptional. And the farther we then go ahead and remove the possibility of mental illness occurring within the Muslim community, the more in denial it's going to be about trying to rectify that situation. But this idea that you're talking about, Jer uh, Jerome, about terminology is perhaps one of the most vexing uh, issues for the Muslim American community because, uh, and, and see if this sounds familiar to you, Las Vegas happens. Uh, the first thing is Muslims become really, really pious, uh, saying, please God, let it not be a Muslim. <laughs> and it's like the five stages of grief. Uh, it, and, then, and then they go into this idea of saying, did you get the name of the person? Did you get the name of the person? Okay, that's been released. Why is it taking so long for them to release it? Because, of course, it's instantaneous if it's a Muslim name. And then to see, are there any uh, uh, um, ties to being a Muslim? This becomes exhausting. Uh, every single time. And then, of course, it's also trying to see who, if any, of the media outlets will deign to use the T word. So I think that the unevenness of that then is internalized not only by the Muslim community, but it is also then internalized by the non-Muslim community to go ahead and say, well, terrorism can only occur if it's a Muslim actor. Please. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for taking my call. And um, my name is Rafat Wahid. I'm here from Chicago. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for taking call. Um, Could you speak up a little or direct more directly uh, to the microphone? Yes, uh, can you <laughs> hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I have to be very close and I'm not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about hate crime. Um, Islamophobia, still there's a debate going on. It's not a hate crime. And um, as the gentleman said about there's a substantial uh, uh, problem with it, and yet the Muslim uh, community is thriving and growing, alhamdulillah. Uh, but still, the, 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 the seed has been sown. It's for the future generations, Muslims, or I mean the, for those who are not Muslims, especially those children who are raised who are going to school and rubbing shoulders with the Muslims. Students, um, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, the Canadian government, I think in 2014 or 15, recognized Islamophobia as the hate crime. I, I kind of watched this video, Can the Canadian. You, uh, sorry, um, we, ju we just have a few minutes. Can yeah, you just so fast um, forward to the question. So my, 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 this is my, my comment I'm making. So. My question is, is Islamophobia considered to be hate crime? Will it be established as hate crime? So Thank should, it, you. should it legally be a hate crime to be well, in? I Islamophobia? think we want to make a, a clear distinction between what people are, th are thinking, you know, their, their thoughts. It's, it's, it's legal in the U.S. to have, you know, extreme thoughts and express things that are, you know, outside the mainstream. But do people act on it? So when somebody... Uh, attacking someone or threatening someone based on their religion, including Islam, is a crime. So it's long been the case that anti-Muslim hate crimes are threat or threats are illegal in the U.S. Right, and that's not dependent on it being Islamophobia, just any protected a class. A crime right? based on religion, right. uh, uh, race, national origin, uh, sexual orientation, and so forth. Yes. Thank you. Next question. Um, hi, Susanna. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize there were two microphones. Okay. <laughs> May I? Uh, my name is Maya Abdurrahman. I'm the president of American Palestinian uh, uh, Women's Association. 
Uh, we're talking about Islamophobia from the Palestinian perspective. It's really connected to the issue of Palestine. Not all Islamophobic groups are uh, with a pal anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab agenda, but many of them are. So d differentiating those groups, I think, is extremely important. But the other more important thing is that to understand that Islamophobia has become internalized within our country. I, I'm, I'm in academia, and I see terrorism uh, and anti-terrorism and all kinds of experts that come out of academia who are trained by University of Maryland and so on. So it looks like to me, while you know, uh, anti, uh, it is extremely important to, to deal with uh, extremism, whether homegrown so, uh, or I'm outside sorry, the country. We, we, we really have to I understand that. The, the question. Uh, forgive me. So my question is the following. How do you make sure that our government is not actually sanctioning hate by granting money to all of these academic institutions to create terrorism experts? And when you, only, when you have really power, Muslim uh, Americans are not really uh, that uppity or uh, they're rather reasonable people. Okay. So you have to Thank create you, a problem. So How do you deal with that? How do you cut the grants? Okay. And let's can we take one, the, let's the let's sister, take this question over here too so that we can take both of them yeah. at the same time? Hi, Susanna Cunningham. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I've heard someone uh, liken terrorism to an autoimmune disease. It's not the illness that kills you, it's your reaction to it. You know, uh, violent extremism is, and terrorism is political. It's, it seeks to elicit a reaction. And I think that when legislators come out in fear-based, fear-mongering, and say they're gonna go on anti-Sharia efforts, or they ask for um, any kind of fear-based policy making, aren't they just operationalized by terrorists? Aren't they just weaponized their fear? Thank you. So we have two minutes. Okay, two left. good questions. You can uh, answer either or both. Uh, Steve, why don't you? I, I, well, I think they're they're relatively related. What I would say is, how do we hold our government accountable? <coughs> I'm looking right back at the people who need to hold our government accountable, uh, in including everybody up here on the stage. If in the United States, <laughs> this report, the Wise Up report that Daisy and her organization has created, is a tool. If we allow that tool to sit in the toolbox when we walk out of this auditorium, we are not doing our part. Your role is to speak up against wrong ideas. Or in the Islamic phobic subculture here in the United States, they commonly selectively choose facts. And so what we need to do is say, no, 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 no. That fact cannot be taken out of context. Let me provide the context. And we, we need to add our voices to that discussion. If we go home and stay silent, then it will continue to grow. We've got to counter it. And that's all of our roles, not just the experts or people in government. Great. Arsalan, you want to have the last word? Absolutely. Oh, just on, on the question over here. Um, it's absolutely the case that, in fact, the, the many of the terrorist groups are counting on an overreaction. They want to provoke an overreaction on governments. Uh, Anwar, Anwar al-Awlaki, the U.S.-born uh, um, al-Qaeda propagandist, uh, said that you know it, he's that the, that that they are counting on Western governments to turn against the Muslim populations in response to the threat of terrorism. So, it is absolutely the case that that um, uh, you know policymakers and government. Um, there's a risk in going too far in countering what they're perceiving to be a threat. And that's a lot of what this report goes into. It goes into how there are many steps that have been taken that were overreaching, and those need to be brought back into line, and there needs to be a reasonable way of addressing this uh, terrorism threat. Uh, Eric, just something very brief. Yeah, I just want to respond to, to something you said uh, involving the Catholic experience in the U.S. Uh, they were a despised minority in the 19th century, it was believed that their loyalty was to Rome, that uh, they could never become loyal Americans, that, that Catholicism was fundamentally at odds with 
the American way. And you look today, you know, five of nine justices used to be six of nine on the Supreme Court, a Catholic, a Catholic president. The idea that, you know, Catholicism can't, can't be part of America is, is crazy. Um, it was tough. I mean, the Catholic uh, community had to struggle for years, build a, a, their own school system. Uh, Jews, it wasn't fair, but they had to develop the infrastructure of, you know, the, the best known, one of the best known Jewish groups is the ADL, Anti-Defamation League. It's not fair that Muslim communities have to devote so, you go to Adam Center, they spend so much time on outreach and, and working with government. I mean, at my church, we spend our time on, you know, spreading the gospel and, okay. and, and doing service projects. And it's just, it's not fair, but it is, um, other communities have been through it and the challenge is there. And I think uh, the Muslim community is up to it. 